Father, thank you this morning for your precious word. We love you. We appreciate you. We thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for making us extraordinary because of the anointing. We were supposed to die ordinary lives. But Lord, you've handpicked us and pulled us out so that we can bring you glory and give you praise. I pray for a fresh anointing upon this word. Bless your people in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We are teaching on the order of wealth. And this week was particularly difficult for us and for me personally because of my time invested with this niece of mine and she um, struggled for many years with depression. And without a driver's license, she took a drive about 3 o'clock on Monday morning and the car flipped. And um, we had to identify her. And then I went to the site of where it had happened and I, I, I this thing touched my life in such a profound way and um, then I was asked to do the memorial service on Wednesday night and the report back on that thing really is what got to me is that so many people that were there that are born again and others that have been that know Christ for such a long time could never just understand that God is a good God I said God is a good God it is important for you and I to begin to understand that, that we're living in a fallen world, but God remains good. And sometimes when you're seeing five-year-olds being murdered and, and, you know, the church always asks, so where's God? Or oh, not the church, but the world asks, where's God? The question is, where are we? And so we must set the order straight because the reason why you come to Christ, there are three things that you must understand when you understand Jesus Christ, there are three things that you get the revelation of. The first revelation you get of, of when you begin to understand and study who Jesus is and begin to have an encounter with him and begin to receive him as your Lord and Savior. The first thing is that it frames the character of God. That's number one. You don't know God. We, no one has seen God. The only reference that you had of, of God is that when you look at through the eyes of Jesus, you start to see the character of God. You begin to understand that God is a good God. And you see Jesus said, the Father and I are one. So you begin to see that, that number one, when you, when you study the scriptures, is and why you need to understand Jesus and why you need a revelation of Jesus is because it begins to frame your understanding and gives you the character of who God your father is. You begin, to, that's the only time you can see it. You can't see it through Moses. Because Moses, um, when you see the law and you understand uh, that he came to give the law, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. When you see the law, the first person to break all of the law was Moses. You can't, you can't live your life through Abraham. You can't live your life through Isaac, through, through Esther. You can't, through, through anybody in the Bible. You've got to come to Jesus. I said you've got to come to Jesus. You've got to begin to understand. The first thing is that it, what, when you understand Jesus, it frames the character of God. It begins to understand that this is the character of God the Father. That's why Jesus would say, pray like this, our Father. Not my Father. It's our Father. That's number one. Number two is, why would you go and study the, Jesus Christ? And in Luke chapter 4 and verse 18, we're trying to understand that. The second thing that you need to understand that is when you see Jesus Christ, you get your identity. You get your identity. And the third thing is that you begin to expose the enemy. I said, God is a good God. When you begin to look at your father and you see who Jesus Christ is and you understand the cross and you understand why he died, you now begin to get a framework of what your father intended is to reconcile the world to himself. It's by grace you get saved. You don't have to work for it anymore. 
You don't have to get punished anymore. You don't have to live under a religious system anymore. God doesn't have any grandchildren. He's only got children. Can somebody say amen? So anytime you come into the kingdom of God, when you see Jesus coming in, 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 and he announces what his ministry, his earthly ministry is all about, he sets up in the tabernacle and this is what he announces. You must understand this, please. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And the end game of it all is found in Luke 4 verse 19. It says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. When you're dealing with the acceptable year of the Lord, it speaks about the Jubilee. Jubilee is a time when, when, the, when the slaves went back home, when, when debt was cancelled, when, when the land was restored, when families had a great time of celebration because things were put back. It was after 49 years, you would know that this is the 50th year, everybody is going back home. He says, that is the purpose of it. And until you begin to understand Luke chapter 4 verse 18, you can't walk into Luke chapter 4 verse 19. The things that belong to you, the Bible says, the things that have been freely given to you, the things that belong to you as a child of God, there is an inheritance with your name on it. The only way that you can get it is that is, is through Acts chapter 20 and verse 32. I think it's 10, 20, 32. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance amongst all those who are being sanctified, who are sanctified. He says, the only way that you can get what belongs to you, your inheritance, there's an inheritance with your name on it. That means there's something that you were supposed to do in the earth. There's something that you were supposed to be possess for the kingdom of God. More than cars and houses. More than you walking. I, I, we like your suit and we like your outfit. We like where you stay. But that's more than that. It's your, your life being fulfilled in the earth. And you cannot get that unless you understand Luke 4.18. What is, what is Luke 4.18? He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me. What is the anointing? Jesus Christ. Christ is not Jesus' surname. It is the anointing. It is, it is, it is an Acts, it is, uh, sorry, a Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 27. It shall come to pass in that day that his burden, that's the enemy's burden, his burden will be taken away from your shoulder. You cannot, you cannot come into your destiny without the anointing. You cannot have the anointing without Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for He has anointed me. Are you with me? The Holy Spirit is not going to confuse, is, is not confused. He's not going to bring a different message. He's here to confirm the word. So if I preach accurately, the Holy Spirit will come upon you this morning and help you break so that you can come in and receive what God has got for you because it is it, it, everything that's a burden to you. There is no way that you can live. Listen, I appreciate psychiatrists and I appreciate every doctor that's trying to assist. But the truth is that even if you're grieving, you have to go to Jesus. Because surely He bore your griefs and your sorrows. You can't go to someone else to get your healing. And listen, time does not heal. You need a healer if you want healing. I've watched people die in time, never get their inheritance. Waiting on God, waiting. They said time's going to heal. Don't kid yourself. He said sorrow not. The reason why we can get up this morning and preach again and pray again is because there is a healer in this house. And he bore our griefs and our sorrows. The Bible says you don't sorrow like the world sorrows. We know this girl's in a better place. But the truth is that we've got work to do now in the earth. 
I've got to lift up the word of God. I've got to make sure that you're not running to a psychiatrist only. Go and get the wisdom. That's okay. But your answer is found in the word of God. He says the word of God is able to build you up and give you your inheritance. The word of God is able to heal you. He is your healer. He is your deliverer. He is your strong tower. He'll the righteous run into him and we are safe. I want somebody in this house to begin to worship the Lord and know that they can be lifted up this morning. That we're not going to go and live the way the world says we must live. I preached about the five stages of grieving on, 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 on Wednesday night. And this man is called the master of grief or the, 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 the expert of grief. Can you become an expert of grieving? And it's all good because all the stuff that he's giving, it's true. But the world will give you the problem. They can't give you the solution. They tell you this is going to happen to you and there's nothing you can do about it. And we know it will maybe sometimes you'll, there'll be denial and sometimes there'll be depression and sometimes there'll be this and, and this is how it's going to come to you. But no scripture to tell me there's actually a way to interrupt the plan of the enemy. You and I can't keep running to doctors and psychiatrists where there's no word. Because only the word of God is able to build you up and give you your inheritance. Don't believe the lie. Everything that God wants done is in his word. He is the word of God. Can somebody say amen? The only way that you can get the burden of the enemy from your neck and, he, and, his, and the yoke from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck and, and, and he, uh, uh, his burden from your shoulder, the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing. When you say Jesus Christ you're not, it's not his surname. Christ is the anointed one and he's anointing. The only thing that the enemy has got no answer for is the anointing. So when Jesus says in Luke chapter 4 verse 18, he says, everything that's been a burden to you, everything that is trying to torment you, panic attacks. You know, the family started speaking about and Many people started speaking about the depression and the panic attacks and they kept on speaking about the problem. And I'm like, okay, I hear you. And no one's heard my story. My aunt sat around the, the table with me and she said, I remember that you couldn't get out of the house. I said, are you forgetting where I come from? The, my major issue was the fact that my mom and in a time of temptation and pressing, laid in an abortion table with me. And that fear of dying hit me from my mother's womb. I was eight and nine years old still wetting the bed because I couldn't get out of bed at night. You wouldn't see me in the streets. I wouldn't be socializing with people. I couldn't go and sleep at, have sleep outs. Because I would wet the bed. I would get panic attacks and I would scream, I'm dying, I'm dying. As a young child. See, people forget that. My aunt looked at me and says, I remember now. I say, you know, we speak about this thing as if, if it's something new. It's, I had it. I would walk into a place, I mean, there would be a time when I just... I mean, claustrophobia, I couldn't get into a, a lift. I couldn't connect with any. This, is my, this was my problem. My whole young upcoming, I could not go anywhere. I could not go attend any function because they were scared I would just scream out and shout that I'm, I'm going to die. My one aunt went to my mother and said, you've got to go and help this boy because I, I was in a house and I just started screaming. I went crazy. Eight, nine years old. And then, of course, from 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, I never went out. They treated me for different things. They wanted to have tonsils removed and all the other doctor stuff. Then one day, my dad sat me down and he said, son, I want you to do something for me. He says, from tonight, every single night, in your bed, here's my Bible. I want you to read Psalm 91. And don't be silent. Read it out loud. Every night. I would just lay in my bed every single, for all my life as a young child. Then one day I started reading Psalm 91. 
He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers and under His wings you shall trust. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. A thousand will fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand. It shall not come near you. Then it adds at the end, it says, He will give His angels charge of you. And with long life, He will satisfy you and show you His salvation. And the first time I read it, nothing happened. And the second time I read it, nothing happened. And for weeks and months, nothing happened. But I just stayed faithful. I did not even understand Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 where you meditate on the word day and night. My father never told me that. He said, just read it out loud every night. Just do what I tell you to do. I can't tell you what happened and how. But there was one Sunday night. The light of God's word penetrated my spirit like I cannot explain. All of a sudden, I woke up in the middle of the night and wasn't afraid of the dark anymore. Listen, I got up believing I'm never going to die. There's something hit inside of me that says, I'm no, until Jesus comes back, I'm going to be alive. And all of a sudden, everything around me stopped. Every, every shadow of death left me. Because the light of God's word penetrated my heart. This is not a preacher. This is a child that is 10 years old. Reading Psalm 91. Stop telling me that the word of God doesn't work. Because when you meditate on His word, God is true to His word. The angels and the demonic forces, they bow their knee to somebody who has the word of God upon their lips. Can somebody in this house say amen? All of a sudden, I was the one getting up in the middle of the night. It's 5.30. There's Mr. Smith and the shops. There's no car. Dad is on his way to work. I must walk in the night while the, the sun's not up yet. It's, it's still dark. I've got to get to the shop. I'm the one walking in the dark. Little kid buying whatever's needed for breakfast and for lunch, bringing it home. Walking. Many people have been living with the shadow of death their whole lives. I'm telling you today, listen to your pastor. There is no way a psychiatrist has got the answer for you. You're going to need the Word of God. You're going to have to put Psalm 91 in your spirit. Not run when you're in trouble and say, me find the scripture. Because at that time, it's too late. Because now comes the attack and the panic. I was there. You need armor. You need something on your lips. You need the word of God coming from you all the time. That thing you must put in your spirit. I'm telling you, there was days and, you know, sometimes years after this. Even sometimes when we get into a place and I feel, you know, I'm in a lift and more people get in. I'm like, I didn't expect so many people to get into this lift. And all of a sudden, I feel like, oh, I was here before. I've not been given a spirit to fear. And as you do that, shoo, you sense the presence of God. But that didn't, doesn't happen in times of trouble. Stop using God like a spare wheel. Put Him in, as the one sitting behind the driving wheel. Not a spare wheel. You must now begin to understand the scriptures and put it, let your children quote the scriptures. There is no other answer. Let me tell you today. You need the word of God. Can I have the framework, please, of, of the, the, the order of wealth? I want to show you something that you now need to understand if there's three things that Jesus Christ is going to give you. One is it, he gives you the character of God. It frames you. Number two is that he gives you your identity. How important is your identity? Think about it in the natural. Until you have an identity, you can't open up a bank account. You can't transact. You can't even get married. 
You can't purchase a house. You cannot do anything until you have an identity. Jesus gives you your identity. And when your identity is straight, then the enemy has got to leave you. Are you hearing me? Then you know who you are and you're walking in the fullness of God's blessing. Because the word of God is able to build you up and give you an inheritance. That's why the first thing you should do is to people, why do you need the word of God? You need the word of God preached to you. Preach to the young ones. Preach to the old ones. Let them know what? That there is a foundation for their lives that they can stand on. That they were made righteous because of the blood. That is the first good news. That you don't have to pay for your salvation anymore. You don't have to work for your salvation. That your identity is not achieved. Your identity is received. You must teach the children of who they are. You've got to teach them how to stand. I looked at this girl and I said, she stood no chance. Man. This enemy came after. And listen, it doesn't matter if you're young or old. It doesn't care if you're a baby. The enemy's mission is to kill, steal, and destroy. Stop messing with this thing and put your children in the Word of God. They, I'm telling you, there is no answer out in the world. That's why I, I, am, I'm not so, I am concerned that you get saved. But after you get saved, you better put some stuff in your spirit. You need to teach your children how to fight. The enemy is relentless. And while we thought, ah, it's just a phase this girl will go through. Three years. And they never came out. And now we say like, you know, ah, Job, you know, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The devil is a liar. That's not the framework of God. That's not the character of your father in heaven. He promised you long life. Can somebody say amen? Don't, don't make an excuse for the challenges that whatever you're going through. There's a way that you get built up. And this is the reason why you need to have a foundation in your life. That you must be able to can tell them that I am an ambassador for Christ. Say I'm chosen of God. Say I'm the apple of my father's eye. Say, I'm accepted in the beloved. Say, I'm not rejected. Come on, somebody. It's the foundation. Your identity must be fixed in God. Don't let people tell you what your identity is. God set you apart. God chose you already. You are special already. You are anointed for this. Can somebody say amen? No man can stand before you. You're going to walk in victory all the days of your life. No man can stop you. You're going to walk in success. Shout, I know who I am. Please hear me. If we have to stay on this until Jesus comes, you know, to get your identity right. So that you can know that when that enemy walks in, whether it be in a lift or whether it's you traveling in traffic or you feel claustrophobic or something has happened, you can stand up against this thing and let the devil know that you know who you are. Somebody say, I know who I am. When Jesus comes with his anointing, it's to build you up. Go with me to the book of um, uh, John chapter 8. Please, verse 1. I think it is John. Ah. Holy Ghost. Ah. Thank you, Jesus. All right, we can come back to this. Mm. Let's deal with the foundation of who you are. Um, get, go verse 2. Are, are we at the right place here? Give me verse 2, guys. Uh, now, early in the morning, he came in, came to the temple, and all the people came in to him and sat down and taught them. Oh, here we go. The scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery, and they set her in the, in, in the midst. They said to him, Teacher, this woman is caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us. See, grace doesn't give you an answer. The law, uh, lo the law doesn't give you an answer. Grace will give you an answer. It says, He commanded us that she be stoned, but what do you say? 
And so they're testing him. But this is the thing that I really enjoy, is that Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger. Now what he wrote, we don't know 100%. But the deal is this. He was going to rebuild this woman's life. And he went to the ground that she stood on. And then gave her the gift. He wrote in his with his finger. And just keep going to verse 7. So they continued to ask him. And he raised himself up and said to him, He is without sin among you. Let him throw the stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Those who heard it being convicted of their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Then Jesus had raised himself and, and saw no one but the woman and said to her, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. The power to sin no more is found in the gift of no condemnation. Many people, I tell you what, the more you feel condemned, you fall into sin, and the more you feel condemned, the more you keep sinning. It is the gift of no condemnation, which is the good news. Can somebody say good news? I'm preaching good news this morning. Because when you understand the power of good news, you get the ability to stand and there's no more accusers around you. Can somebody say amen? It's called the foundation of righteousness. That when you're standing on righteous ground, when you're standing, when you receive Jesus Christ, and you know, the law will condemn you, the, even the best of us, the law will condemn you, but grace will lift up the worst of us and get us to stand in His presence and able to deal with the accusers of the brethren. Can somebody say amen? Because it is the accusation of the enemy that is getting you to not be able to can function in the earth. Now, this is important to understand. When you speak about being the righteousness of God, you are now in a different posture. What is, when I say you're the righteousness of God, it is the ability to stand before God without a sense of guilt, condemnation, inferiority, complex, or a sin consciousness. Righteousness is the DNA of God at work in the believer. Are you a believer? Say, I'm the righteousness of God. Listen how important this one is. Number three, it is the equality with God. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. Wow. Number four, it's a consciousness of my status as a member of the God class. I'm a partake of the divine nature. And here's the thing when you understand you're the righteousness of God. If I understand I'm the righteousness of God, that what is, in, what is not in God cannot be in me. Is there any sickness in heaven? Is there any depression in heaven? It cannot be in you. It cannot be in your children. Because you are the righteousness of God. Somebody say, I'm the righteousness of God. Have a look at this. This message is a message of meat. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For He made Him, God made Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. That you were made righteous. You can't say, I'm a sinner. If you are a sinner saved by grace, you are now the righteousness of God. You've got to make up your mind. Are you a sinner or are you the righteousness of God? Because anytime you feel like a sinner, you don't feel like you're going to get your prayers answered before God. You feel condemned. You feel like you're not worthy. And that's not the DNA of a child of God. Because the DNA inside of you and I says we are the righteousness of God and we have a blood bought right to have our prayers 
answered. You have the blood bought right to walk in the peace of God. Come on, somebody. Wherever you travel, wherever you go, no evil will befall you. You have a blood bought right to quote Psalm 91. You can stand before God and you can stand before man and you can know that you are, there is nothing wrong with you. What does condemnation mean? When somebody walks into a building, government goes into a building, looks into town, maybe whatever dilapidated, dilapidated building there is, they would mark it as condemned. What does it mean? Unfit for use. You can't occupy that. And anytime you feel unworthy, it's like the Holy Spirit is it's like you're saying, well, Lord, you know, what you've done is not enough. And so the Holy Spirit can't indwell me or use me because I feel unworthy. What's your feelings got to do with the truth of God's word? So you messed up. So what? So get up in the name of Jesus. So stand up and become what God has called you to be. So fight back and say, I am the righteousness of God. Can somebody shout back in this church? Don't let the enemy go and put a mess in your head. Kenneth Hagin said, you know, it's one thing for the birds to fly over your head. But the day they start making a nest in your head, it's a problem. Don't let the enemy put his rubbish in your head. Do you, do you understand? There, there's a woman that came to, 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 to Kenneth Hagin and said, look, can you just please pray for me that the devil never harasses me again? He says, no problem. He says, Father, I thank you that she'll die peacefully. She says, I never asked for that. He says, the only time you're going to have peace from the enemy is when you die. You better learn now how to stand up and fight back and somebody shout back. The devil's a coward. And anytime somebody knows who they are, the devil has got to give way and let you become what God has called you. You're going to get built up and receive what God has got for you. You're going to walk in peace all the days of your life. You're going to walk in strength all the days of your life. You're going to walk in victory all the days of your life. Thanks be unto God who always causes me to triumph in Christ Jesus. Can somebody shout and say amen? Don't let the enemy tell you that you're still a sinner. Or that you are condemned. I don't care what you've done. Before you even thought up of that sin. 2,000 years ago, Christ died for you. Saw it and died for that. He's not coming to die again for your special thing that you feel so bad about. Get over it. Listen to me. I'm announcing it in this church. You will live depression free in this place. I am telling, I'm announcing it in the heavenlies. Everybody in this church, you will walk with peace of mind. For the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but righteousness. No, you say it with me. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Say it again. Righteousness, peace, and joy. Anytime you understand you are the righteousness of God, the next step you take is peace. And after peace, the next step is joy. And if the enemy cannot steal your joy, he can't keep your harvest. Say, I'm strong in the Lord. Say, I'm strong in the Lord. Say, I'm victorious. Listen, don't make me say for you. You must say for you. Go back to Psalm 91, please. Say with me, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I, stop. Not Pastor Max. Say, say, I will say. Say, I will say. You wake up every morning. My father didn't say, let me say for you, my boy. You say for you, my boy. Nine years old. You say for you. So the devil can't torment you anymore. You say for you. Don't let your children, I just want to pray for you. If they can read, let them read Psalm 91. But don't let the children, don't, don't let, make, well the church will just pray for me. You must say of the Lord. We're in a fight, man. But I need you to say, can we all see the same thing? Say the same thing at the same time. I am announcing it again. In this church, anybody who walks through these doors with mental illnesses will find peace. 
they'll find joy. They'll find strength. And they'll walk in victory. I will say of the Lord. Say it one more time with me. He is my God. In Him, I will trust. Say it again. I will say of the Lord. He is whose refuge? My refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him, I will trust. Clap your hands this morning. Clap your hands this morning. You are the righteousness of God. And I've got to end. Lord, help us this morning. My God, help us this morning. That the enemy no longer. I, you, 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 you can't tell me the enemy mustn't harass you anymore. Tell the enemy to stop harassing me. The enemy is laughing right there. And he'll never stop. And you know, there was a guy that was the bully in the school. And every time he would come and tell the people who was going to beat up. And this one guy that they knew could beat this bully. When they listened to the bullies and got onto his, checked his list, the bully would brag about, I can beat this one, that one, that one, that one. And so this guy says, he goes to his friends, he says, hey, listen, bud. I'm hearing this bully's got your name on his list. He says, really? He says, go and check it out. He comes there to the guy, the bully, he says, hey, Mr. Bully, I heard my name's on your list. You saying that you can beat me. He says, yeah, your name's on my list. And yeah, he says, listen, you can't beat me. I'm going to beat you. The pants off from you. He says, you can't beat me. He says, hold on. Takes his list out, scratches his name out. He says, okay, you can't beat me. Do you understand that with the enemy? Today he's taking your name off his list. Today he's taking your name. Because anytime somebody knows who they are, the enemy's got to take your name off his list. The Bible says he's seeking whom he may devour. He can't devour everybody. Say, I know who I am. Go back to my to to the, the table, please. I want to show you something. The first is the good news is that you're the righteousness of God. The next news is that you are healed from every broken heart. You don't need a Valentine to make you happy, honey. If you're waiting for Valentine to make you happy, your foundation is missing. And you will always live with a broken heart. Because you cannot outsource your happiness. You can't expect another man to make you happy. You, in fact, the men, you can't expect the woman to come and satisfy you. You're going to have to go and deal with your broken heart before your father. That's the reason why we sing the songs that you are no longer a slave, that you will belong in the father's house. You can't walk around pining over your daddy. It wasn't there. Your daddy's gone for 20 years already. You're still crying and looking for your father. When you have a heavenly father, there is no earthly father that is perfect. That's why God the father doesn't have grandchildren. He's only got children. Why? He's here to heal your broken heart. But you've been made the righteousness of God. That becomes your foundation. Now put up Psalms 11 verse 1, please. I think it is actually verse 3. Verse 3 says, give me the next verse, guys. If the foundations are destroyed, the foundation for a great marriage is Christ. Our marriage was in such a mess. She was 19 and pregnant. All the young ones supposed to look at me and say, don't do it like that. I wasn't saved. We had to come to Christ 
to find out it wasn't my Methodist upbringing that made it a great marriage. Christ had to be the foundation of what we did. You can't have your heart placed in the hand of another man and wait for him to come and satisfy you. And if he's not there, you're unhappy and you're sad. I'm trusting some of you never waited for Valentine to give you a rose. But at least I'm speaking to the singles. Because there's days you like that, you must go out and get up and get happy. Then you go and you say, look, I, I'm booking the restaurant. Uh, how many? Booking for one. Fla where are the flowers? I brought my own flowers to the party. Where's the chocolates? I brought my own chocolates to this thing. And I'm going to celebrate me because I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Somebody shout, I know who I am. Young ones, don't wait for a man to satisfy you and to outsource your happiness. Your happiness comes from the Lord. Your joy is the, comes from the Lord. Come on, somebody, say amen. Stop allowing people to break your heart and then, you know, the next man comes and then he must come and try and fix up all the pieces. Say, I know who I am. Let me give you more in your foundation. I've got three minutes and then I've got to end. Uh, when you understand that you're the righteousness of God, Jesus, no one can stop you, child of God. No one can stop you. Romans 5, 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift. Righteousness is a gift. You will reign in life because of the gift of righteousness. Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom, read with me, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and, and, it doesn't say all. It says you start with righteousness and what does God add to righteousness? And then he adds, where? In the Holy Ghost. Come on, speak to me. Hallelujah. Give me Isaiah 54 verse 13, please. This is what I pray over you and I pray over my children. All your children shall be taught by the Lord and great, come on, read with me, and great shall be the peace of your children. Next verse. In, in righteousness, you shall be established. You shall be far, say far, far from oppression. For you shall not fear. And from terror, panic attacks, anxiety, worry, all of that, it shall not come near you. Come on, say it with me. Say it one more time. In righteousness, you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression. For you shall not fear. And from terror, it shall not come near you. Terror cannot come near you. Let them shoot guns all around you. It's got to bypass your house. It cannot touch your home and your life. Somebody shout amen. I don't care if the world doesn't want you. I do care that the world hasn't got protection. But the truth is that God will make a separation in the house of God. Let the company go down. You will stand. Let no evil will befall you. Your house is off limits to the enemy. I said your home is off limits to the enemy. I said they can't come near you. So on a Friday afternoon, they, you know, we, we're on our way to the Eastern Transvaal. And um, about 11 o'clock, we've got a couple of things from, from the shops. And we on our way home. By the time we come home, our gate is wide open. The cops are everywhere. I'm asking what is going on. They said, no, there's a guy that, that, that stole the uh, wages of about 20,000 rand from a, from a construction site. He ran all the way down. He jumped over your neighbors. He jumped through yours and he's somewhere around here and he's either here, there, and, and, and. So I'm like, really? Okay. So the cops, are, their guns are out and they everywhere. My yard, the neighbors jumping up and down, and, and, and. And so they can't find this guy. And so I'm, I'm, in, the, I'm in the yard and I'm looking at this thing and they're about to leave. 
And so I said to the Holy Spirit, I said, Holy Spirit, is this man still here? The Holy Spirit said he's still here. Don't let the cops leave. The cops says, no, we've watched it. Said, I stopped. I said, oh, I have some inside info. He's still here. He's like, what do you mean? I say, you can't go. I'm telling you, he's still here. They walk around and and and. The next minute, you just hear the screaming. And you hear the gunshots. And what happens is, we're standing in our yard, at, the, at our gate, at, our, at another, the yard, at our, the entrance of our house. And this guy jumped into our yard. He jumped into the neighbors and was hidden on the side of the wall. So when the guy started coming from that side, he jumped over the wall with the bag in his hand. I thought, my man, you should at least tithe on that money. I'm kidding. He walks, he walks past Pastor Z. Pastor Z goes, hello. I mean, can you, like an usher in the church. It's like, so courteous. The guy runs, and the next minute the cops are running, they come to my house, and they're like, he jumped over the one neighbor, jumped over the next one, jumped over the, the guys were busy building a pool on that side there. He switches, puts some, some overalls, pretends like he's one of the workers. They got him, they got him out, and he came down. The cops had him. I'm like, hey, sorry, buddy, man. You just jumped into the wrong yard. <laughs> because you could have gotten away with it. But the truth is that anytime you touch the righteous ground, you're going to get yourself into trouble. Somebody shout amen. They can't come near your home. Do you hear me? They can't touch your home. You will live and not die. There's no cancer. There's no tumor. There's no sickness. There's no disease. There's no evil. There's no terror. There's no fear that will befall you and your home. Somebody shout amen. Let's end up. Verse 15. Indeed, they shall surely assemble, but not because of me. Whoever assembles against you shall fall for your sake. The worst thing you can do is come up against the righteous. The worst thing you can do is come and mess with somebody who knows who they are and they are born again. Not just because they just say, well, Lord, I, you know, Lord, why is this happening? No, no, I am the righteousness of God. And I tell the people, I warn them, I say, don't come up against me. Because you're coming up against God. The God on the inside of me, the DNA on the inside of me doesn't allow me to stay down long. You're going to rise to the top because you are the cream. Verse 16. Behold, I've created the blacksmith who blows coals in the fire, who brings forth an instrument for his work, and I've created the spoil to destroy. But, should somebody say with me, no formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is from where? Is from me, says the Lord. Clap your hands and clap it strong. Clap stronger. Clap stronger. Clap stronger. I said clap stronger. Say I am the righteousness of God. He says, the only people that can refute a word, when somebody sends you a word and say, you know what, you're disgusting. You can shut that word down. No, say I'm favored. He says, the righteous have got the right to cancel word curses. Every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness. Is from me. Don't let people and aunties come and say, Oh, your child looks hectic. No, your hairstyle looks hectic. My <laughs> child is blessed. Amen. Come on, somebody. Yeah. <laughs> Don't let them put that word curse on your children. Your children are blessed. Say, I'm favored of the Lord. Say, I'm the righteousness of God. Say, I walk in victory all the days of my life. Say, I am anointed for this. Say, I'm anointed for this. Come on, lift your hands and declare and declare. Say, I'm anointed for this. Say, I walk in victory all the days of my life. Say, I know who I am. Say, my home is blessed. My children will live and not die. They will walk in victory all the days of their lives. 
Now get up and shout and give Jesus the biggest praise.